Good morning. We are learning Parashat Emor. We are using the art scroll Chumash and we are on page 673. The book of Vaikra, the third book of Moshe, is called in um, <coughs> um, oral Torah. Torat Kohanim, which means the instructions for Kohanim, because the book of Vayikra has a lot of laws relating to the service of Beit HaMikdash and the uh, uh, laws of Kohanim. And Parshat Emor specifically speaks about laws that relate to Kohen Hedyot, a regular Kohen, as well as Kohen Gadol, the chief Kohen, the, the, the main Kohen, the great Kohen. And the parsha on page 673, chapter 21, starts with laws of Kohen Hedyot, regular Kohen. And we speak about prohibitions that Kohanim have in addition to prohibitions and commandments that regular Jews have, and then we will speak about prohibitions that Kohen Gadol has. Now the Torah says, Say to the Kohanim, Each of you shall not contaminate himself to a dead person among his people. Kohanim have a commandment not to come into contact with a dead body. Kohanim serve ha uh, Hashem in the temple. Kohanim represent us in front of Hashem. And Kohanim give a blessing. And uh, through their service, they provide atonement for the Jewish people. And therefore, since they deal with the service of the king and since they deal with providing jewish people with blessings and forgiveness and life it is improper that they should have contact with death death even though it's important to, to remember that all of us will die but we have to serve hashem and live a life with happiness we have to focus on life and not on death that is why in in jewish um, religion we do not make cemeteries in the middle of a town we make cemeteries outside of the town and we separate the cemetery from the rest of the people with a fence Unlike non-Jewish cemeteries that can be along the road, that can be in the middle of a, a residential area, and they don't put fences, or if they put fences, they're see-through. The Jewish cemetery is supposed to be on the outskirts of the town, and it's supposed to have a fence, because we don't want to dwell on sadness, we don't want to dwell on negativity we remind ourselves of our own day of death but we always say lechaim for life we always keep in mind that we are alive and therefore th uh, things are expected of us that only a living person can do and therefore we try not to dwell on death and just like kohen a regular Jew who becomes impure by coming into contact with a dead body must count seven days and undergo purification process by sprinkling the ashes of a red um, cow mixed with water on the third and, and the seventh days and immersing himself in the mikvah on the seventh day. Um, and that's it. Our contact with death is finished. Just like a person whose close relative passes away, they do think about death for seven days. They do remember and mourn 
and offer consolation to each other for seven days, and that's it. They get up from the Shiva on the seventh day, and they continue with their life happily. So Kohanim, being on a higher level, being in constant service to Hashem, they have to be on a higher level and on a happier level. We know that a person should not pray unless he is in a good mood. If you are depressed, if you're in a sleepy state of mind, you're not supposed to pray. Prayer is a lively celebration of life and thanks to Hashem. And so Kohanim, when they offer prayer and offerings to Hashem, they must be in a happy mood. <clears throat> and therefore, a Kohen, more than a regular person, must stay away from any impurity, but specifically they have a negative commandment not to come into contact with a dead body. Now, verse 2 says, what, a, what if he has a death Shalom in his immediate family. So it says, except for the relative who is closest to him. If a close relative dies, a Kohen is allowed to participate in the burial. He is allowed to visit the cemetery during the, the, the burial. And the sages say, what does it mean? The relative who is closest to him. That refers to a wife. If a wife of a Kohen passes away, he must come and take care of her and he's allowed to touch her and be in the same uh, house as she. And then the Torah adds six more relatives. His mother, his father, his son, his daughter, his brother and his sister who is still unmarried. Once a sister gets married, she is joining the other family. And then the other family is responsible to take care of her. So there are seven relatives that a Kohen is allowed to contaminate himself with. Now, verse 5. We have a, a prohibition of causing yourself injury because one is so um, broken because of death in his family. We are not allowed to do that. The Torah says, you shall not make a bold spot on your heads, which means the custom of some non-Jews and idol worshippers was that when they are mourning, they would tear hair out of their head as a sign, as a proof that they are so sad, they would actually slap themselves, they would tear hair from their head, they would cut themselves. Chas shalom. we are not allowed to do that. And they shall not shave the edge of their beard, and in their flesh they shall not cut a gash. So the Torah specifically says it for Kohanim, but this applies to any Jew. Any Jew is not allowed to injure himself as a proof that he is mourning for his um, loved one. And that is because of two reasons. Number one, we realize that death is not the end of existence. If we would know that there is nothing beyond death, then yes, if our loved one closes his eyes for the last time, chas shalom, that would be the end of his existence and end of our relationship to him. And that would be a cause of deep mourning. We cannot bring him back 
and we're crying that we will never see them again. And we are mourning for their fate that they died young or not in their time. But if we know that death just means separation of the neshama, of the soul and body, the body is put to, into the ground to decompose because it has served its purpose. And now the soul is free to join Hashem or to come into another body and start its life again, there is no deep mourning. We feel sad that the person did not accomplish everything they wanted to, that a person does not have opportunity to do mitzvot anymore and grow, but we are comforted that soon we will re rejoin them in Tichiyat Ametim, in, in the resurrection of the dead, when Mashiach comes. And we also console that their neshama will come back in one of our children or in one of our grandchildren. And reason number two why we don't mourn and we don't injure ourselves is because our body does not belong to us. Hashem is renting the body to us, is leasing the body. We are a neshama, and Hashem said, would you like to come into the world? Would you like to be tested and have opportunity to earn eternal reward? The neshama says, yes, please. And Hashem says, fine, I will lease a body for you. The body will be like a car. You're leasing a car and you're allowed to use the car. Once the lease is up, you return the car to the dealership and you get a different car. But if at the end of lease you bring the car back and it's all smashed and, and uh, cut, then you'll have to pay for it. It wasn't your car. You were just leasing it. So too. Our body is not ours. The neshama is only using it temporarily. And therefore, we have to take care of our body. That is why there is a mitzvah in Torah to guard our health, to take care of the body. As we have an expression in Russian, vzdarovom tseli zdarovy duch, or translated into English, in a healthy body, you can have a healthy soul because the body serves as a, as a vehicle for the soul. So if the body is not able to perform properly, then the soul will not be able to accomplish what it needs to. So if a person is negligent in taking care of his health and because of it, he will be sick, chas shalom, and because of it, he will not be able to go to synagogue to do mitzvot, to study Torah because he's sick, the soul will be punished chas v'shalom for failing to take care of the vehicle. And now, because of it, it cannot accomplish spiritual um, pursuits. Therefore, taking care of your body is not a physical um uh, job it's a spiritual endeavor when you keep your body healthy not to become ocd not to uh, spend hours and hours researching and preparing meals and exercising and then forgetting about the rest of life no you do the minimum effort and you stay away of anything harmful drinking alcohol drugs unhealthy behavior you have to get enough sleep, get a little bit exercise, eat healthy, just normal, minimal effort. And the rest of the time you um, put in to spiritual endeavors. So that's the second reason why Jewish people are not supposed to cut themselves or maim themselves because of a death, chas shalom, in a family. Now, we continue to verse 7 that tells us 
mar marriage restrictions for regular Kohanim. They shall not ma marry a woman who is, number one, a harlot, a prostitute. What's a prostitute according to Jewish law? Any woman who is not loyal to one partner, whether they're married or not, or any woman who had relations with a non-Jew. She loses for the rest of her life um, ability to marry a Kohen. Number two, Kohanim cannot marry a woman that has become desecrated, which means not by her own choice, which means she is born from a father who is a Kohen, but he married a woman who he is not allowed to marry, which means her father is a Kohen, but her mother cannot marry a Kohen. So such marriage produces children who are not Kohanim. They are called Chalalim, desecrated. So in uh, Judaism, we have uh, multiple levels of um, uh, spiritual genealogy. Number one, we have Kohen. And the, under Kohen is Levi. Under Levi is Yisrael. Under Yisrael, we have Halal. And that is a Kohen who is no longer Kohen. He's considered lower, spiritually blemished. And therefore, he's lower than Yisrael. And then we have, unfortunately, even a lower uh, level, and that is Mamzer. And that is someone who is born from a union of, uh, that, that is forbidden. If Kohen marries someone who is forbidden to him with a negative commandment, that creates a halal. But if Kohen or a, a Jew marry someone who is prohibited to them with a more severe prohibition, not only a negative commandment, but it carries a punishment of karet, spiritual excision, or death penalty, that union produces a mamzer. And the mamzer cannot marry a Jew. Mamzer can marry another mamzer, or they can marry a convert, and their children stay mamzerim forever. Whereas a halal, who came from a forbidden union of Kohen, and a woman who is forbidden to him with a negative commandment, where the punishment is lashes, not spiritual excision, there... He is allowed to marry a regular Jew. He's just not allowed to marry a Kohen, which means if it's a girl, she's not allowed to marry a Kohen. And if it's a boy, he's not considered a Kohen, he's considered Halal. And number three, <clears throat> a third restriction for Kohanim is a divorced woman. That means that a Kohen is allowed to marry a woman who has been previously married, but her husband died. A Kohen is allowed to marry a widow. A Kohen, a regular Kohen, does not need to marry a virgin. There are only three restrictions. A Kohen is not allowed to marry a harlot. A Kohen is not allowed to marry a halala. And a Kohen is not allowed to marry a divorcee, a Gerusha. Now, we go to page 675, and here we have a positive commandment for all Jews to honor Kohanim. We must show honor to Kohanim by giving them precedence whenever uh, we do mitzvot. For example, when we bless Birkat Amazon, we give the honor to Kohanim. To lead us. When we read the Torah, we give the first Aliyah, the first Torah reading to a Kohen, and so on and so forth. We give Kohanim honor. Um, we recognize their special status by giving them precedence in all matters of mitzvot. And then the Torah says, because of their higher status, if a daughter of Kohen commits 
adultery, she receives a special death penalty. Unlike a regular girl that commits adultery, a regular girl or a regular boy that commit adultery or other forbidden sexual relations, they also get death penalty. But the daughter of Kohen receives a higher death penalty. Whereas regular adultery is a death by henic strangulation, a daughter of Kohen receives a serifa, which is death by burning the innards with molten lead. Okay, now we go to verse 10 on page 675. And these are laws of Kohen Gadol, the great Kohen, the chief Kohen. The Torah says, the Kohen who is exalted above his brothers, he, verse 11, shall not come near any dead person, even his relatives, even his father and mother, which means while regular Kohen is allowed to attend the funeral of his uh, parents, his siblings and his children and his wife, Kohen Gadol may not. The only exception for Kohen Gadol is if no one is able to take care of um, the dead body, which means if a Kohen sees on the road a dead body and no one is taking care of it, then Kohen Gadol must contaminate himself. He must attend to the, um, the body and bury it. Otherwise, even though it's his father and mother, he may not contaminate himself with them. Now, we continue with marital uh, restrictions that Kohen Gadol has on top of regular Kohanim. And that is, a Kohen Gadol is not allowed to marry even a widow. Regular Kohen cannot marry a divorced woman, but a Kohen Gadol cannot marry a widow as well. Kohen Gadol must only marry a woman who has never been married or has never had any uh, re relations with anyone else. In verse 17 and on, the Torah speaks about um, rest uh, um, blemishes of Kohanim. The Kohen, the Kohen must be wholesome. Not only in his soul, like we said, he has to come from a kosher um, marriage of his parents, but he also has to be wholesome in his body. And the Torah lists 12 blemishes that if a Kohen has, he cannot serve in a temple and he can, um, um, and in our times, such Kohanim do not give the Birkat Kohanim, the blessings of Kohanim. For the congregation and some of them are if a kohen is blind or he's limping or if his nose has no bridge which means it doesn't have this part and if you draw a line from one eye to another it can go straight without any um interference or if a kohen has a broken leg or a broken arm and it um, didn't heal yet, or it healed in a crooked way. As well as if a Kohen is a hunchback, or he is a dwarf, or he has um, a skin disease that is visible. Okay, now we turn to page 677. And uh, verse 22 says that even though Kohen who has um, a blemish cannot serve in a temple, but he is allowed to eat offerings. Now verse 22, uh, chapter 22, speaks about laws of Kohanim who became contaminated. Verse 3, say to them throughout your generations, any man from among 
of your offspring who shall come near the holies of that the Jewish people sanctify to Hashem with his contamination upon him that person shall be cut off from before me I am Hashem which means there is a severe prohibition that carries a karet spiritual excision penalty for Kohen who serves in the temple while being contaminated or Kohen who eats offerings while being contaminated. Now we turn to page 679 and we have an additional prohibition for Kohen who is contaminated and that is he is not allowed to eat teruma. Not only Kohen who is Tame cannot eat offerings, he cannot even eat donations that Jewish people give him from their produce, which is called teruma, the 2% that a farmer gives Kohen from his produce. And verse 10 says, No layman shall eat teruma, which means no Jew or Levi, anyone who is not a Kohen cannot eat teruma. Anyone who is working for a Kohen, he is not considered part of, of Kohen's family, they also cannot eat Turuma, even though they work for Kohen. However, if Kohen acquires a, a non-Jewish slave who becomes his uh, property and part of his household, the slaves of Kohen may eat Turuma. And a Kohen who is impure cannot eat Turuma. And daughter of Kohen who marries a Yisrael, anyone who is not Kohen, she can no longer eat Turuma. Daughter of Kohen who lives with her father eats Turuma. But once she gets married, she can no longer eat Turuma even when she visits her father. Now, um, in verse 17 on the same page, we learn about blemishes that if animals have them, they cannot be sacrificed. And the verse um, 18 says, Any man of the house of Israel and of the proselytes among Israel who will bring his offering for any of their vows or their free will offerings that they will bring to Hashem for an elevation offering to be favorable to you, it must be unblemished. Any in which there is a blemish you shall not offer, for it will not be favorable to you. Now we turn to page 681. And we list these blemishes. They're very similar to blemishes for Kohanim. And examples are if an animal is blind or it has a broken limb or a split eyelid or split lip, dry skin eruption, one limb is longer than the other, or if it, the, the hooves fused together or whose uh, childbearing organs were damaged you shall not offer to Hashem nor shall you do these in your land from here we learn that we're not allowed to castrate our animals because the Torah says you cannot sacrifice such animals to Hashem and in your land you may not do it. Therefore, from here we learn that we are not allowed to cause our animals to become sterile, whether they are dogs, cats, or um, our cattle. Often farmers neuter or castrate their animals because they want them to gain weight. Um, if 
the, the animals continue mating, that makes them weaker. And, and um, in order for animals to become more fatty, they castrate them. And that is a very severe prohibition for a Jew to do. Um, what happens if a Jew has a, an, a, a pet, a dog or a cat, and they don't want them to have children? It's not a good idea to, to have a pet in such a case because it is a very severe prohibition. If they already have a pet and they must, for some reason, neuter him, they cannot do it themselves. They have to, this is uh, only in a, as a last resort, better not to do it, better not to have a pet at all than to do it. As a last resort, a Jew has to give this animal as a gift or to sell this animal to a non-Jew. And then this non-Jew should already take him to a veterinarian. Uh, but again, this is... Uh, not recommended and it is not a good idea now we go to verse 27 and we learn that an animal can only be offered in a beta mikdash when it lived already for seven days when an ox or a sheep or a goat is born it shall remain under its mother for seven days and from the eighth day on it is ex acceptable for a fire offering to Hashem. Then we learn a negative commandment not to slaughter a mother animal and a baby animal on the same day. An ox or a sheep or a goat, you may not slaughter it and its offspring on the same day. Verse 29 teaches us about the Thanksgiving offering that it must be eaten on that day and the night, but it, you cannot leave any of it till the morning. Even though the Thanksgiving offering is classified as Shelamim, peace offering, and peace offerings are allowed to be eaten for the day that it's slaughtered, the following night and the following day. But Korban uh, Toda uh, uh, Thanksgiving offering can only be eaten for one day and the night. You have to finish it by dawn. Now, in verse 32, we have two great commandments, one positive, one negative. One is called Chilul Hashem, desecrating God's name, and one is called Kiddush Hashem, sanctifying God's name. These are two most important um, mitzvot in the whole Torah. We live our life in order to sanctify God's name and chas shalom. we must not do anything that would decrease God's honor in the world. And the verse says, you shall not desecrate my holy name. Rather, I should be sanctified among the children of Israel. I am Hashem who sanctifies you. So in everything we do, we have to think, how will it reflect on God? Will people who see me doing it praise God and say, how great are God's people? How great is God whose servants behave in such a refined manner? Or will they say, look at these Jews, look at what they're doing. What kind of religion they have? Chas v'shalom. Now we turn to page 683 and we learn about the holidays. Verse 2 of, of chapter 23. Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, Hashem's appointed festivals that you are to designate as holy convocations. These are my appointed festivals. First the Torah speaks about Shabbat. For six days, labor may be done, but the seventh day is a day of complete rest, a holy convocation, a holy assembly. You may not do any work. Verse 4 speaks about Passover. 
These are the appointed festivals of Hashem. Verse 5. In the first month of Nisan, on the 14th of the month, in the afternoon, is the time of the Pesach offering to Hashem. And from 15th day of the month, for seven days, is the festival of Matzot. You shall eat Matzot for a seven-day period. Verse 9 speaks about the Omer offering. Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you shall enter the land that I shall give you, you shall reap its harvest of barley. You shall bring an Omer from your first harvest to the Kohen. We are on page 685, verse 12. On the day you wave the Omer, you shall perform the service of an unblemished lamb in its first year as an elevation offering. Verse 13, its meal offering shall be two tenths of ephah far of fine flour mixed with oil. Verse 14 teaches us the law of Yashan, that we are not allowed to uh, eat flour or grain from fresh um, harvest until the Omer offering. Once we bring the Omer offering, we are allowed to um, eat all the produce that was harvested or gave root before Passover. And the, the verse 14 says, you shall not eat bread or roasted kernels or plump kernels until this very day, until you bring the offering to your God. So right now, we are already after that day, and therefore right now, all grain, all flour that is found on uh, store shelves, in shops, in restaurants, is permitted until the new harvest, which is going to be around uh, July, August. So until July, August, uh, this rule doesn't apply. From August, we already have to check, is this produce from last year or from the uh, grain that was planted before Passover? Or is this grain that was planted after Passover? In which case, we cannot eat it. We have to wait until the next Pesach to eat it. Now, verse 15. You shall count for yourselves from the day when you bring the Omer of the waving seven weeks. They shall be complete. Until the morrow of the seventh week, you shall count 50 days and you shall offer a new meal offering to Hashem. And that is the holiday of Shavuot that falls on the 50th day after the second day of Passover when we bring the Omer offering. And on Shavuot, the Torah says in verse 17, two loaves made of two tenths afa, they shall be fine flour. On Shavuot, we bring two loaves of bread from wheat, whereas on the second day of Passover, we bring the offering of barley. On Shavuot, we bring the offering of wheat. And together with the bread, we bring seven unblemished lambs and one young bull and two rams. And in verse 19, you shall make one he goat as a sin offering and two lambs as a shelamim peace offering. Now we turn to page 687 <clears throat> and we have laws of uh, gifts to the poor that the farmer must give. Verse 22, when you harvest your land, you shall not remove completely the corners of your field. And that is the mitzvah of Pe'ah. We have to leave the corners of our field. Second mitzvah, you shall not gather the gleanings of your harvest, which means if a stalk or two stalks fall down during harvest, we have to leave them for the poor people. If three stalks fall down at the same time, we are allowed to pick them up. For the poor and the proselyte shall you leave them, I am Hashem your God. That is the mitzvah of Leket. Now we learn about Rosh Hashanah. 
verse 24. In the seventh month, on the first of the month, there shall be a rest day for you, a remembrance with shofar blasts. You shall not do any laborious work, and you shall offer a fire offering to Hashem. Then in verse 27, we learn about Yom Kippur. On the tenth day of this month, this seventh month of Tishri, it is a day of atonement. You shall afflict yourselves and shall offer a fire offering to Hashem. Afflict yourselves means we cannot eat and drink as well as not anoint us ourselves, not take a shower, no marital relations, and not wearing leather shoes. Verse 28, you shall not do any work on this very day, for it is a day of atonement to provide you atonement before Hashem your God. Any person who will not fast on that day will be cut off from its people. And any person who does work on Yom Kippur will be cut off from his people. In verse 33, we learn about the holiday of Sukkot. Hashem spoke to Moshe saying, speak to the children of Israel saying, on the 15th day of this seventh month of Tishrei is the festival of Sukkot. A seven day period for Hashem. Sukkot means huts, booths. On the first day is a holy convocation. You shall not do any laborious work. For a seven-day period, you shall offer a fire offering to Hashem. And on the eighth day, there shall be a holy convocation for you. The eighth day is called Shemini Atzeret. That's a separate holiday. We count it as the eighth day of Sukkot, but it is considered a separate holiday. Now we have a summary of all festivals on page 689 in verse 37. These are the appointed festivals of Hashem that you shall pro proclaim as holy convocations to offer a fire offering to Hashem, an elevation offering and its meal offering, a feast sh uh, shalamim offering and its libation, wine pouring, each day's requirement on its day. Aside from Hashem's Shabbats and aside from your gifts, aside of, 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 from all your vows and aside from all your free will offerings which you will present to Hashem. And now we have uh, some more details about laws of Sukkot. But on the 15th day of the seventh month, when you gather, gather in the crop of the land, you shall celebrate Hashem's festival for a seven-day period. With the first day being a day of rest and the eighth day being a day of rest. You shall take for yourselves on the first day the fruit of a citron tree, which is a trog, the branches of date palms, which is a lulav, twigs of a plated tree, which are hadassim, and brook willows, which are aravot. And you shall rejoice before Hashem your God for a seven-day period. You shall celebrate it as a festival for Hashem, a seven-day period in the year. An eternal decree for your generations. In the seventh month shall you celebrate it. And now we have a mitzvah of building and living in Sukkot. You shall dwell in booths for a seven-day period. Every native in Israel shall dwell in booths. Now we're in page 691. So that your generations will know that I caused the children of Israel to dwell in booths when I took them from the land of Egypt. I am Hashem, your God. Now, According to Halakha, this refers to two events. Number one, that when the Jewish people left Egypt, they dwelled in actual booths that they built, huts that they built for protection from sun. And that's what we commemorate, that for 40 years we didn't build houses, rather we lived in huts. And it also refers to the clouds of glory that Hashem surrounded the Jewish people on all four sides, plus or over us, and under us, so that as we walked, it, it was like a carpet. Now, we go to chapter 24. 
we speak about menorah. Verse 2, command the children of Israel that they take to you clear olive oil, pressed for lighting specifically, to kindle a continual lamp, as opposed to oil for flour offering, we mix flour with oil, there oil can be crushed completely, uh, the, the olive is crushed completely. Over here it says it should be crushed only a little bit, not crushed but pressed for lighting. Oil for menorah has to be extra pure. We squeeze the olive until the first drop of oil comes out. After that, when um, we have to already crush the olive to extract the oil, such oil is not good for menorah, but it is okay for mincha. Aharon shall arrange the candles from evening to morning before Hashem continually, an eternal decree for your generations. On the pure golden menorah shall he arrange the lamps before Hashem continually. In verse 5, we have mitzvah of lechem hapanim, to bring loaves of bread and set them on a golden table in the holy sanctuary. You shall take fine flour and bake it into 12 loaves. Each loaf shall be two-tenth a fa. You shall place them in two stacks, six in each stack, upon the pure golden table. And you shall put pure frankincense on each stack in a bowl. So on top of six loaves of bread, each one was supported by special um, tubes. On the top bread, there was a bowl of incense. So they would, they would bake the bread on Friday. And verse 8 continues and says, Each and every Shabbat he shall arrange them before Hashem continually. So the bread would stay on the table throughout the week from Shabbat until the next Shabbat. And then the following Shabbat, they would remove the old bread, put in the new bread. And that seven-day-old bread, the Kohanim would eat. And a miracle would happen every week. That bread, seven-day-old bread, would stay fresh and warm for Kohanim to enjoy. Now we turn to page 693, and here we have an unfortunate case where there was a fight between two Jews, um, and one of them proclaimed a curse against Hashem. Verse 10 on page 693, the son of an Israelite woman went out and he was the son of an egyptian man he was a jew but his father was egyptian this was a single case where a an egyptian raped a jewish woman and she gave birth to this child and there was an argument between him and other jewish people as to where should he pitch his tent? Where does he belong? Since he, he doesn't have a Jewish father, and the area where you camp, in camp, depends on your father, he went to his mother's um, um, area, the tribe that his mother came from. And people there were upset at him. And of course, that is improper they shouldn't have uh, taken the matter into their own hands they should have asked Moshe and who would ask Hashem what to do in such a case they took the matter into their own hands and they told him you don't belong here your father is not from our tribe why should we share with you then we're going to have less space they fought in the camp and the son of the Israelite woman and Israelite man. So a man who had an Egyptian father fought with a man who had 
both parents Jewish. Verse 11, the son of the Israelite woman, an Egyptian father, pronounced the name of Hashem and blasphemed. And everyone heard, and they brought him to Moshe. And they placed him under guard to clarify for them to clarify for themselves through Hashem what to do with him. Hashem spoke to Moshe and saying, Remove the blasphemer to the outside of the camp, and all who heard shall lean their hands upon his head. The entire assembly shall stone him and tell the Jewish people, any man who will blaspheme his God shall bear his sin. And the one who pronounces blasphemously the name of Hashem shall be put to death. Now, verse 17 continues with laws which we call mida keneged mida, measure for measure. And a man, if he strikes mortally any human life, he shall be put to death, which means penalty for murder is death. And a man who strikes mortally an animal life shall make restitution, life for a life, which means he has to pay the value of the animal. And if a man, man in, inflicts a wound on his fellow as he did, so shall be done to him. Our sages interpret this through oral Torah to mean that he must make a monetary payment. A break for a break, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Just as he will have inflicted a wound on a person, so shall be inflicted upon him. And logically, it makes sense that it can only mean monetary payment because Anything else will not fulfill the verse. The verse says, as he did, so shall be inflicted upon him. And that it would be impossible if we're talking about a physical um, infliction. Which means, if someone hit his friend, how can we ever hit him in the same place with the same force and cause the exact same damage? How is that ever possible? to cause him the exact same pain. No two people are the same. And we cannot estimate exactly how many newtons of force he applied and how sensitive that person was to pain. That is impossible. And therefore, we estimate how much a person would be willing to get paid to suffer such pain. And this man has to pay for the damage, he has to pay for the pain, and he has to pay for embarrassment, and if there are doctor bills, as well as time lost from work. Verse 21, one who strikes an animal shall make restitution, and one who strikes a person shall be put to death. Now on page 695, we have equality in verse 22. There shall be one law for you. It shall be for proselyte, a convert, and a native alike. For I, Hashem, am your God, just like I am God of uh, Jewish people who were born Jewish. So too, I am the same God. I created all of you of converts. Verse 23 finishes up the story of the blasphemer. Moshe spoke to the children of Israel and they took the blasphemer to the outside of the camp and they stoned him to death. And the children of Israel did as Hashem had commanded Moshe. And we finish the Parsha with these words and unfortunately we actually lived through such a sad event that so many Jewish people died last night. They were actually, they actually underwent this exact death penalty. It was not a penalty, but unfortunately this death, that they fell and they were trampled, which 
Talmud says is equivalent to death penalty of stoning. And anyone who undergoes that, his sins are uh, atoned for, he's purified, and he goes to heaven. Just like anyone who deserves death penalty, he does teshuva, and the, the, the court uh, stone him for a reason to provide atonement. And when he dies, he becomes a complete tzaddik, and he goes straight to Gan Eden. And these people yesterday, they were involved in a mitzvah, in a celebration, and they were happy. And when people are happy, they do teshuva from happiness, from singing and rejoicing. And at that moment, when their neshama leaves, you can be sure that they go straight to Gan Eden. They are pure, they give their life in happiness at a moment of rejoicing and celebrating and Bezat Hashem may their neshamot uh, dwell in peace in Gan Eden and rise up higher and higher through our prayers and through our mitzvot and our Torah study. Thank you for listening. May we only hear good news. May we never experience trouble anymore. And uh, Bezat Hashem, Bezat Hashem, may the families of these people find comfort. May Hashem send them quick comfort and may Mashiach come quickly in our days. Amen. Shabbat Shalom. All the best.